Hello, everyone. I'm Mabel Chan. Welcome to my podcast, One in a Billion. Today, part two of our special series, Find Your Roots. Find Your Roots is about Asian American mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, looking back at the roots of their family history, cultural identity, and personal journey, one person at a time. My name is Irene Li. 我叫李爱雄 Irene Li is a chef, a food entrepreneur, and business consultant with big ideas about ethical sourcing, fair and transparent employment practices. I was born in Boston in 1990. I'm a millennial. Some would call a, a geriatric or older millennial. In 2012, Irene opened Mei Mei Street Kitchen as a food truck with her older brother Andrew and sister Margaret. A year later, she opened Mei Mei Restaurant in Boston. Mei Mei means little sister in Mandarin Chinese, and Mei Mei food is an expression of Irene's favorite childhood eating experiences with her siblings. She has worked on farms, taught in prisons, and watched hundreds of hours of YouTube videos on food and cooking. Irene was not formally trained in culinary arts or hotel and hospitality business when she went to Cornell. She designed her own program with a focus on cultural studies. I identify as Asian American and Chinese American, and、um, that's something that I had to kind of work through and figure out over time. Today, we trace the roots of her culture, her culinary passion, her work and life philosophy. Here's our conversation. I grew up in Brookline, Massachusetts, and I guess that is pretty far away from the Chinese roots of my culture. Where do those roots lie, to the best of your knowledge? My dad's family is from Guangdong, and my mom's family is from Qingdao. And I've gotten to visit both of those places. Wish that I could spend more time there,、um, but it's so interesting to go to where your roots are and to be a foreigner. So that has been a, a cool and really thought-provoking experience for me. When I googled you, search terms, Chef Irene Lee, I got over six million hits. <laughs> All right, beginning with Mei Mei Dumplings, Boston Chef, Restaurant Owner, James Beard Leadership Award Winner. Project restore us, turning passion and play into impact, and many more. So, I'd like to first probe a little bit into your relationship with food in your family. How would you describe the roots of your fascination with food growing up as a child? Well, I've always been a big eater. And in a Chinese American family with with two full time working parents, dinner time was always kind of the key touch point during the day. Six p.m. at the dinner table was a requirement for everybody. Most of our family life that happened collectively took place around the dinner table. I've always loved to eat. And I have very fond memories of ordering my favorite dishes and getting to go to X, Y, or Z restaurant as a special treat. But I didn't start really thinking about cooking until I went to college. That's where I sort of fell in love with the process of learning how to cook, which of course requires experimentation and、um, willingness to fail.、Uh, but I always say, you know, if you mess up the recipe, you just eat the evidence. I just love food so much, and realizing that it was a way to share my perspective, my point of view, and my values. For tough conversations, for celebrations, for anything where people are coming together, food really makes the magic happen. It does, and it's instant glue to form a family. Yeah, you know, people suddenly are nice. Yeah, and if you're eating half the time, you can't be talking over people. <laughs> so you know, it occupies your mouth. I think that's a very practical element of it. So it allows for give and take in a conversation. Nice. Who in your family made what kind of impression on you through the food you were fed? Well, my parents didn't really cook. They were both MDs and worked full time jobs, and so we had babysitters and we had nannies.、Um, but I remember cooking and eating with my dad. He and I both loved 
the salty fish that oh. comes in a can. Oh, ham yu in Cantonese. Yep, exactly. Oh. With um with the salted black beans. And nobody else in my family liked that. Oh. It's kind of like stinky and salty yeah, 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 and, yeah. Um, and ugly earthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it yeah. looks horrible. Scary. Exactly. Um, but he and I both loved that. So we would eat it with rice or with Joe or, Joe. you know, I remember sharing those moments with him and feeling like, oh, like we know what's good. <laughs> wow. This is fantastic. This reminds me, I just want to share quickly. Please. My dad. We're Chu Chow people. It's still Guangdong province. So my dad also loves Zhou, you know, the kanji. He loved the intestinal stuff, mm-hmm. you know, liver, kidney. Yeah. And he would show me how to eat it. He would show me a little dish, soy sauce and white pepper mm. and dip it in there. Now, to me back then, it's like, wow, that's really foodie. You right. Know? Absolutely. My mom, very busy, uh, three kids, worked uh, for a family business. So uh, she would always make Campbell soup, mm. cream of mushroom. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you know? Yep. With spaghetti. Wow. So you put the spaghetti yep. in the cream of mushroom, and I will be very full and ready to go. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> now, at what point did food turn into passion or play and then impact As a food business, I know this is an insanely broad question, but go at it. Yeah, I think food started out as play for me, going to the farmer's market, seeing what I could find, figuring out how to cook it. And it turned into passion when I realized that so many of the issues that are relevant to food, the inequality around food, the need for justice and dignity and access. You know, I had dedicated myself um, and my academic work to racial and socioeconomic justice um, and workers' movements and things like that. But food was on the outside of that. And then when I realized they could be combined, food has a place in social justice. That's where the passion came in. And then impact, gosh, I was asked recently on a panel if there was a moment when I decided to be a leader. And there really wasn't But there were so many moments where I felt like I have to act. I have to act on what's in my heart. I have to act on something that I'm seeing in the world that needs adjusting or commentary or change. That's what makes a leader. You were not formally trained. Uh, You have a passion with food, but there are a lot of foodies right out there. And then if what you make is only with passion, but with no no Mm know-how or techniques and skills. So how did you hone all of that? How did you grow your chops? A lot of it is just practice. Home cooking was was a great introduction because I played around with a lot of different ingredients, a lot of different techniques. I read all these food blogs and I read about different dishes that are regional to the United States or to other countries. And so I feel like I got to explore in a very broad way. And then on top of that, I did work in a restaurant for a couple of months. So at the end of my junior year, my brother had started talking about opening a food truck. And I thought, oh, gosh, like he's going to need my help. My sister and I, we both moved home. I took um, a leave of absence from Cornell. And that's when we opened the truck. And of course, a one year leave of absence became two years and that became three. And then finally, you know, my mom said to me, it's time. And so I went back and um, graduated belatedly. Um, And a big reason why we moved home was because we wanted to be with our dad, who had Alzheimer's disease. So that brought all three of you together so you can have siblings' time to be with your dad, your mom, and also hone your home cooking skill together. Is there a culinary or business background in your childhood? Not in my childhood, um, but my paternal grandmother, she had restaurants in New York City and in Westchester. She had the kind of classic immigrant story, which is you come from abroad and the only thing that you can get into to support yourself and your family is one of the very few industries, you know, laundromat, convenience store, restaurant. And they went restaurant. She was incredibly successful in providing a better life for her family. 
her kids now, they are the physicists, the lawyers, wow. the Wall Street stockbrokers. So that's kind of the American dream. And then here I am going back into the restaurant well, industry. Well, I wouldn't say back because you originated something yes. very different. Yeah. Oh, my grandma would be mad if I were just running the same old business model that everyone else is. So she she would be okay with it because I'm doing something really different. I want to push the industry forward and I want more support for not just myself and my business, but for all businesses, especially immigrant-owned businesses. You know, running Meme has been so hard. I can't imagine doing it if I didn't speak English as my first language, you know? I'm Ivy League educated, and it's still so challenging, even just paperwork, you know? So even though there is no culinary or business background in my immediate family, I think I carry the kind of sense of hospitality, the love for feeding people, and that's why I do it. So I know the pandemic clearly has abandoned your food truck business, business model, and led you to a new idea, new commitment, and you pivoted very quickly and very well. But I still want to dig a little bit to the roots of business ethics, right? Or social responsibility, priority. What is the root of that? You grew up feeling really badly for inequality around. Is there a moment? Is there a seed? Growing up in Brookline, it's easy to be very insulated from the outside world. And my parents really made a point of exposing me to other versions of life. Abroad, locally, I felt very privileged. When you're young and you're you're coming to understand your privilege, it's natural to want to shy away from it. Why is that? Why is it natural to shy away? I think some people are ashamed or it's embarrassing. You don't want to be the rich kid in class. So for me, the whole point of privilege is that you can use it. Yes. It's a tool. Yes. And so I'm always thinking about, okay, how do I leverage what I have, my network, my resources? How do I make sure that everyone can enjoy the results of the privilege that I have. Wow, that's very grand and noble of you. Now, I don't know if it's noble, but it's what gives me satisfaction. And I just believe so much in in sharing, in generosity, in abundance. Um, There's nothing that I won't share with someone who asks for it. Now, you've identified as Asian American, Chinese American, in particular because of your parents from China. So at what point in your life did you become curious about your roots in China? Early childhood, teenage? I first went to China when I was five years old. And I remember feeling very alienated um, because I couldn't really speak the language. It, It all felt so foreign to me. But it did make me curious about where our family was from and what they had experienced. And Over the years, I continue to learn more about my family. My aunt, for instance, wrote a book about the Lee family side, their story, which really is incredible. On your dad's side. On my dad's side, yeah. His parents, his father was a general in the National Army. He and my grandmother ran an orphanage and a women's center during the war. All of that was really incredible. They saw a need and they just dealt with it. I also want to share that it wasn't until college that I started to identify kind of a politics around being Asian American. Certainly in my immediate surroundings in Brookline um, and where I went to school, a lot of the Asian Americans fell kind of within the, the model minority, which of course is a myth and has a lot of negative ramifications. But I didn't see anyone Asian American rabble rousing. And I hadn't learned about Asian American movements. I hadn't learned about what happened to Vincent Chin. I hadn't heard of Yuri Kochiyama. And in college, where there was Asian American studies, I found that there is a very rich, radical political history Mm -hmm. of Asians in America. That, I think, connected me in a new way Mm -hmm. to that identity that I, I hadn't really been able to access before. That's fascinating what you're describing, because certainly my generation, I did not go through any of that kind of thinking because the politics of the time in this country were very different. Yes. So have you gone back to your ancestral hometowns, home villages in China and try to 
trace your roots and what does that mean? Not not in recent years, unfortunately. In Guangdong, there is a museum that I think in my grandfather's name and really captures a lot of that era, his work and his colleagues' work. That opened um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So I've not been. So I would absolutely like to do that. Am I right that he faced up to the Japanese? Yes. He also wrote about seeing corruption on all sides. And he was very, very unhappy. Right. He has a sense of righteousness. Yes, absolutely. Do you? Oh, big time. (laughs) (laughs) You got that from your grandfather. Yeah, I got it from my grandfather. And then also I think I got it from my mom. Oh, tell me about that. Well, her siblings, they're all named after the Confucian values. So she's Xiang Wen Yi. And that has to do with righteousness. My name is Li Ai Xiong. So Ai as in love and Xiong as in um, Ying Xiong. Ying Xiong, oh my God. Which typically is a a kind of a considered a male um, character or name. And so I I had a lot of explaining to do about that. There is kind of a, a streak around righteousness. That's something that I'm very proud of, and I also try to be careful with. Because you don't want to sound too judgy. You can go too far. Um, And I think that for me, again, because of my privilege, I feel that it's up to me to message with care and to bring people in and to have hard and draining conversations um, for a better purpose. Wow, I love bringing people in and have a long and draining conversation. Draining? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, these days we do talk about emotional labor and how in many corporate settings, women are asked to explain to men how to be less sexist. Uh. We have to do it. Um, <laughs> us, after everything you've done. I think it often happens to to Black folks and especially Black women in corporate settings, for example. But I went to, to prep school. I went to Milton Academy. And so my second language is upper class, privileged, private school, educated white people. You nailed it. If I have fluency in that language, then I should be trying to translate. A lot of folks, they don't really understand what white privilege means. They might not understand different inequities. We're even more divided around these issues now than we were back when I was in high school. But I think that I have an ability and a stability where I can afford to provide this kind of time and labor, even if it's exhausting, explaining for the umpteenth time. You care. I think that's most important. You cannot teach people how to care. You can show them. By the way, you explain, translate, it's not a language or concept, but is transcending and relating. That's right. Send it out there and bring it back together. Yes, absolutely. Around food, probably. Yes, (laughs) Yes, preferably over some dumplings. How much do you know why your grandparents came to America? My grandparents on my dad's side came to the U.S. for medical treatment, but also fleeing the Japanese and the Communist Party. And I know that they came over on, I think it's the General Gordon, the name of the ship. And they went into San Francisco and then they ended up in New York City. Now, knowing that as a fact, how does that hit you? Where? In the head, in the gut, in the heart? It's definitely in the gut. I'm an anxious traveler. (laughs) And so thinking about loading up six kids and getting on a boat and going to a country you've never been to before, like that, the the courage there, that's why it, it gets me in the gut. And it helped a little bit when you're fleeing from something. Yes. And you're fleeing towards something for healing. So that's the dad side. Yes. And your mom's side? My mom's side. So my grandmother came to the U.S. She was sponsored um, to go to Mary Mance College, um, which I believe is in Ohio. And that was um, through the church. And she was on a scholarship. Um, She played piano and, and sang. And in some ways, you know, it it seems like a fluke. There were two students, uh, her and her sister, sponsored from China. What are the odds? I believe that she met my grandfather when he was working in the States as a chemical engineer. So listening to you talking about that, of your grandparents on your dad's side, your mom's side, someone back then, way back then, enabled them, right? Right. And so that might have been the roots of your own 
searching. Have you thought about how, you know, they were enabled? You know, someone was generous. And now you look at what you have. Have you considered combining or tying those together in some ways? I do think about that. I think about the generosity of of strangers often. I think about the odds that we exist. I read recently my grandfather's war journals that were translated from Chinese. And every other page is like 5,000 men died, 200 men died, 15,000 men died. What are the odds that that he would survive? I mean, he was a general, so obviously he was in a different position. But just thinking like, wow, wh- what are the odds that he would live, that he would meet my grandmother, that they would have these kids? And so I, I think that I have a sense of gratitude for just <laughs> the sheer luck of existing. And my career also has taught me that little things can make a big difference down the line. Because of that, I try to invest up front in earning my karma and then being able to to redeem it in the future. Wow. I am very touched by two things you said in the last couple of minutes. First, your grandfather, you know, as a soldier, general, commander, what soldier would also stop and write, he must be a poet? He absolutely was. I think in another life, um, that that would have been his calling. He did not naturally um, gravitate towards authority or power. In many ways, I think he he was called to do it by others and felt an obligation for it. And I, I do identify with that on some level. Wow. And the entrepreneurship, you know, in terms of how you saw opportunity and you want to turn it into something to benefit more people. Yeah. It's funny, the word entrepreneurship. Um, When I was in college, I did some work with um, the Entrepreneurship Center at Cornell. And then I I quit because I got so sick of it. Oh, I I was like, well, there's social impact, you know, social enterprise. And then I looked around and I was like, these are all pre-MBAs. Like, what am I doing here? I'm not, I'm not going to go into banking. I'm not like, this isn't me. And I really felt alienated from Uh. that group. And now I speak at HBS and the hospitality school about business all the time. So it's funny. Right, because it's funny. of the idea and yeah. the practice of it you exactly. know, has evolved and evolved so much that now you are a megastar. You know, you, we got to hear from your experience. Yeah, I think it's important to make space for the, the untraditional perspectives, especially in traditional spaces. Um, there are new, new and other insights, I think. And so I love being able to tell the kind of winding path of my story. Um, And I think that hopefully it it adds value. How would you describe the seeds that your parents may have planted in your head for what they wanted you to be as a woman, as a professional, a daughter? My parents never set out a path for me. They wanted me to be a good person, (laughs) to do good, to play my role. But um, it was never, you know, law school or medical school. I think that was their parents to a certain extent. So much privilege to be from the kind of third generation to have the option to follow a passion yes. and not make choices out of, out of economic necessity. And I think that my parents also encouraged me to just do all kinds of different stuff. I was such a highly enriched child. I was in the Girl Scouts. I did piano and cello. I did fencing. I did figure skating. They said it was okay to quit. So I think that gave me an appetite for new things. I also like to joke now that I love quitting. But I think that everything has its time and its place. And that's why we closed May May. The event of my dad having a stroke, which happened when I was 12. There is a lot from my childhood that I don't really remember. A lot of things happened that they told me a lot of things, that they showed me a lot of things, and that they loved me and supported me in ways that I don't consciously remember, but it did happen. I love that question. I'm not sure if they gave me advice, but I know they did. Looking at the domain of your food choices that you're specialized in is Chinese uh, or Asian. So it's rooted in that. But how about the American roots, in terms of your style. We often have called it creative Chinese American. Uh, I like to call it multicultural. In many ways, it looks Chinese and it's deeply American. 
outside. It looks like a dumpling. We have been criticized that the food's not authentic. My response to that is it's authentic to me. And I'm inviting you to experience my story. If people come into Meme saying, oh, I'm looking for pork fried rice, General Gao's chicken, we say, oh, we, we know exactly where you should go. And it's somewhere else. And that's okay. What I hear is that you own your narrative, that we are evolving sharper and sharper in terms of how to own up to your narrative, right? So you justify what you want to do and how. And the yes, I can. Yes, we can mentality is so uniquely American, don't you think? I think so. What is so good about our culture right now is that we want to step into other people's experiences. That's why we have podcasts. We have yeah. books, film, and TikTok videos and all of that stuff. And so with Maymay, we're inviting people into our story. It's not just my story. It's all of ours in many ways. But it's rooted in my approach to food and how I was raised and what I was eating. I want to ask you whether you can pinpoint a moment. The Chinese values and the American values actually come to a head, either in your own life or you see it happening around you. I like the phrase third culture, which is meant to take after the phrase third space, like the coffee shop, the library. It's the third space. It's not home. It's not work. It's something else. The way I think about who I am culturally is just like that. It's not that I'm half Chinese and half American. It's that there is a melding into some other thing. For me, there is pressure or conflict that I have felt with family, um, with generational differences, but I wouldn't necessarily boil it down to what feels Chinese and what feels American. Changing topic a little bit in terms of drilling down on individual influences. So my father passed away two years ago and oh. yours... He passed in away in 2015, 2015, so it's been eight years. My father passed away two years ago, so there's a lot that still are bubbling in terms of what he once said to me. Number one, don't make me lose face. Number two, you got to do your math. You got to know how to do your math. So that's about spending, basically. Right. Is there any similar types of orders or demands from your parents or grandparents? Yeah, I think it all comes out of love and wanting to protect. Seeing my sister have kids has taught me a lot about everything my parents have done for me. It helped me understand why my mom is protective. One example is um, in late 2019, I started thinking about hosting a public event where we would show the May May profit and loss statement mm. to the public. This is an example where, where my dad said, you know, be there first with the most. No one had ever done it before. And I said... I think it's worth it to try. And it's okay to be the first one. And like, let's see what happens. My mom did not like that mm. idea. Probably at the time, I thought, oh, mom, you know, eye roll. Um, you're so old fashioned, whatever. <laughs> old school. Yeah. 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 Um, and of course, she wanted to protect me from criticism, from opening myself up too much. And I think that she and I would both agree that I was right to do what I did and she was right to feel how she felt. But I am a very contrarian kind of person. I'm motivated by proving people wrong and bringing them on board in the process. Well, this is great. I want you to drill down just a touch more. Where did that idea come from? Did you observe that is a source of tension in terms of the profit and loss and therefore open it up? I mean, how did that idea come to you? It was probably five years into running May May. I sort of took a look around and said, these jobs aren't very good. These are people I love who work with me. I'm looking at it from their perspective. I would say, quit that stupid restaurant. You don't have benefits. You don't have health insurance. You make hourly, you know, less than $20 an hour. Get out of there. And I thought, this business needs to be worthy of the people who choose to come work here. In many cases, they're highly educated. They could work anywhere. And so how do I create something that is worthy of these people? I looked at becoming a co-op, like employee stock ownership. I looked at a lot of different ways that we could change the nature of work at Maymay. And then finally, I came across open book management, which is widely practiced in manufacturing, in some tech companies. I see. The whole idea with open book management is that if you bring people into the circle, they can actually help you 
run the business Mm -hmm. and grow the business. It's not a zero sum. We introduce them to some of the painful realities. We pay them to study. Wow, you really invest in them so that they become a stakeholder. Exactly. I'm going to change gear from the food to family. So your mother in our interview talked about how fraught it is for Asian Americans to grow up with two feet in two worlds. So I wanted to just ask you, how important was it for you to study Chinese language, culture, and history? Well, like I think every young person who grows up, I feel like, thank goodness you made me do that even though I hated it. Oh, why is that? Because now I have just the tiniest bit of access Mm. to Chinese speakers, Mm. um, to Chinese culture. And my brother and sister have much less than I. I can see how those early choices lead to big differences Uh. later in life. One thing that I think probably no one anticipated was that going to Chinese school would make me feel very not Chinese. Because in the Boston suburban Chinese school, most of those students are kids who speak Chinese at home. They need to learn the written language and proper grammar. When I went the first day, they put me in a class with kids half my age. I think it showed me how American I am. And I think that that's had positive and probably negative impacts. But um, it really showed me that I was not part of the second generation Chinese community. And for a little while, I thought, oh, well, maybe I'm like not really Chinese at all. I have always tried to be proud of being Chinese. But when you realize that, oh, I'm not that kind of Chinese, I'm not that kind of American, then then again, it's how do you make a third thing? Can you talk a little bit about what's most memorable about your parents or grandparents, they're teaching the discipline, acts of love, sacrifice, any of those things that have made you feel loved or indebted or less so, like guilty and shameful. One of the interesting things when I think about my parents is that there's actually a lot I don't remember from my early childhood. Some of that is probably because of the kind of traumatic experience of um, my dad having a stroke and then developing Alzheimer's, it sort of left me with a puzzle. I know that my parents love me. I know that they spent a lot of time with me. I've seen the pictures, but I can't put myself there. I don't remember it. And of course, love shapes you. Who in your family has the biggest impact in your life? And how does that impact change you? I think it has to be my mom. My mom and I spent a lot of time together when my dad got sick. My older siblings were out of the house. And so in a lot of ways, we were alone together during that time. There were a lot of things that we experienced together that no one else in our family did. And, you know, my mom and I, we still argue. We don't agree on everything. Um, But I feel that I know her and she knows me. I wouldn't trade that for anything. What is one teaching or warning from your parents or grandparents that you remember most? One thing that my mom always quotes from my dad, she always said that his approach, he was a cancer researcher, his approach was be there first with the most. Or he would say be there firstest with the mostest. And I think that to me... That means not only that you can be first or you should be first, but that it's okay to be first. It's okay to do something that no one has ever done before. It's okay to experiment. And you can do it. You should do it wholeheartedly. I want to close the interview by asking you, how do you see your Chinese or American roots coming out in new and different ways at this stage in your life? I'm 32. Most everything about me is pretty American. I identify with this country for better and for worse. I identify with the people in this country. I think what being Chinese has given me recently is insight into other immigrant experiences. On TikTok, for example, there are all these jokes about like immigrant moms and immigrant aunties. We can relate across so many different ethnicities and races. That's something that I think is really, really beautiful. 
I think that for all of us to work together, we need to find those points of common ground. I think we're getting better at it. We're indeed getting better at breaking down barriers and building our common ground. One of the most striking things Irene said was about the kindness of strangers. It was the generosity of strangers that opened doors for her ancestors to come to America. Now, as Irene says, she's paying forward. What has enabled her parents and grandparents? Now she's trying to do the same to empower others. You may remember Irene talked a lot about her mother, right? That's Dr. Elaine Shang. Elaine was on this podcast with me last month. Check it out on our website at www.oneinabillionvoices.org, on YouTube, One in a Billion with Mabel Chan, or on Apple iTunes. My parents would bring me into Chinatown growing up, and that's where I would get it. The beef tofu and the wide rice noodles, that's what I'd always get when I went into Chinatown. That and the wonton noodle soup. Always loved it. That is Paul Lee, co-owner and manager of the restaurant Hong Kong in Harvard Square. He will tell you what makes it hard for him to find his roots, and why he continues to follow in the footsteps of his parents' restaurant business that's become a legend in Cambridge and in Boston. Tune into our next episode, the last Tuesday of June. One in a Billion Find Your Roots special series is made possible in part by a generous grant from the Phi Lambda Charitable Trust. We also rely on listeners like you to sustain our production. Please consider supporting our work with a donation. To donate, just go to our website at www.oneinabillionvoices.org. Click donate. Your donation is tax deductible. One in a Billion is produced by our sound engineer and designer Brian Latwinowicz, and our lovely theme song is composed by Brad McCarthy.